And we've got this too as a backup in case something happens. <coughs> All right. So today is November 9th, <laughs> 2019. Good start. <laughs> yes. It's November 9th, 2019, and um, we're here in Pack Memorial Library. So we'll start over here, and we'll, we'll just say our names and our birthday. Okay, my name is Marcel Williams, born 1939. Asheville, of course, is home, born and raised here. Went to public school here, Stevens Lee High School, graduated in 57, got drafted, got out the military, came back here, started a family, had several good paying jobs, worked American Inca, left there and went to Southern Railway, and from there to the U.S. Postal Service. Married, three kids, five grandkids, three great-grandkids. And growing up in Asheville during the time that I was growing up here in the 50s, it was the best time and the worst. I've seen both sides of the coin. Growing up doing segregation, it was something you had to live with. And I tell young people about my experience growing up in Asheville in the 50s, early 60s, was that coming from high school, Stevens Lee, we used to walk to downtown and we had five and 10 cent stores in Cresses, Newberries, and Woodward. And we would stop in, friends and I, and get 10 cent worth of candy, because back then, 10 cent gave you a lot. And you'd be at the counter, and the salesperson was on the other side of the counter. And if you were first, or next in line, I should say, and kids that came in from Lee Everett, which was the white high school here in Asheville, a lot of the salespeople would almost like you was invisible. Now, some would actually ask, who's next? But the majority of them would bypass you to wait on this, the Lee Elwood kids. And that really, really used to hurt. And you had two choices. You could either get upset and leave, or wait till you get served. Those were the choices you had growing up in the time that I'm speaking of. And one of the saddest things in my life, I'm speaking personally, coming out of high school in 57, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, I used to think that we, when I say we, we, we were covered then. We didn't contribute. We didn't do anything in this country. And I had been out of school for 10 or 11 years, and Bill Cosby, the comedian, did a black and white documentary telling about the black history in this country. And it was at the old library on the square, and I sat there and saw that and really was upset that I didn't learn these things when I was going to elementary, junior high, and high school. And because it wasn't taught in school, your parents didn't know anything because they came out of school before you, and if their teachers didn't teach it, well, they could pass it on to their kids. And it wasn't in the internet, how were you going to find out? How would you know? And so years later, I seen one of my high school teachers, and I asked him about that. I said, why we didn't learn about the contribute that people of color had made in this country. And she said, I'll tell you why. The school board would not allow us to teach you things like that. And not having the opportunity to learn about your history that people of color have contributed to this country, to me, is a crime and shame. And what I would really like to see our younger black kids 
learn about this history. Be proud of what you have contributed, or your people have contributed to this great country. Because uh, we all have a story to tell. And that was my, some of my experience going on. And another thing before we <laughs> jump to the next person. When you caught the city bus, from the back door to the back seat was reserved for people of color. And they had a sign at the back of the bus over the back seat, rear of the bus, for colored passengers. That was understood. You knew where your place was. You didn't like it, but you had to abide by the rules that were set in place. What elementary school did you go to? What elementary school? Well, I went to Livingston. I stayed on Livingston, and Livingston ran from the first through the sixth. And from there, I went to Hill Street for two years, and from there to Stephen Lee for four. And do you remember what teacher it was you asked about black education? Oh, God. I, I can't think of her name, but we was at the YMI drugstore. On, on Market Street, and one of the uh, attorneys out of Charlotte, Ferguson, uh, he was in town, and it was a meeting at YMI, and I happened to run into one of my teachers, and I asked this question about being taught things that we were going through school that we were never taught, and she made the remark that we were not allowed to teach these things. Um, Incredible story, and I'm so glad that you came and are talking about everything. <coughs> well, one more thing I wanted to get clear on is what kind of stores were uh, integrated. It sounds like the Five and Dimes were, and I assume Dunham's Music Store was. Like if I'm thinking just downtown. Well, uh, when I came through, with anything integrated, uh, the movies. We always said in the valley, upstate, and uh, we had a, a theater interior that was on Patton Avenue. Of course, that was white on. You could not go. And uh, the rest of the theaters, you had to sit in the bathroom. And realistic, you got a better view. That was a great thing. They had us going to the back. You had to go to the back side. Uh -huh. the back was good. You could go in the front door. You had to go in the back door. Yeah. So yeah. when you were talking about going in the five and dimes and them serving a white student, even if you were in line ahead of them, yeah. that was after integration? Well, I didn't see integration. I didn't see integration going up. Uh, integration came along in the middle of the 60s. And I'm talking from 53 to 57. And uh, I know, of course, this didn't happen here, but this happened to me personally. I had, had got drafted came back home, I had a funeral. My grandfather on my mother's side passed away in 62. Came back to Asheville for the service, had leave. And I flew in and caught the bus going back to Oklahoma. And my bus ticket said from Asheville to Knoxville to Nashville to Memphis to Oklahoma City. And I'm thinking we going due west. So I get on the bus, and this is in 1962, you had your Freedom Riders coming down from the north to register colored people, black people. And going down the road, I'm looking out the window, and I see a lot of Alabama tag, car tags. And I'm thinking, there's a lot of Alabama people in Tennessee. And get down the road, and the driver said, uh, next stop, Huntsville. I said, is there a Huntsville in Tennessee? I knew about the missile test in, in Huntsville, Alabama. And we pulled up in the uh, trailway, and we had to go to the back to be served. And I went to the back, 
and it was not something that I wanted to get served from that particular place. So I got back on the bus, we going down the road, it has gotten dark, and I'm the only person of color on the bus. The next stop, Little Rock, Arkansas. And believe it or not, I said a prayer because I realized that something had to happen to me. No one would have ever found out. And this was in 62, of course. And when I got to when, when I first got to Oklahoma, we came by train from Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And the train actually stopped in Ashbury. We used to have a train station here in town. And we had a 30-minute layover. And I was so close to where the depot was that I could double time <laughs> 10 minutes, five minutes. But anyway, when we got to Oklahoma, Lawton was the town that the post was built around. I saw this black gentleman in the train station. I'm waiting on the post bus to come pick us up to take us to Fort Seal. And I asked him, I was uh, race relations in this town of Lawton. And he said, son, he said 20 years ago, if you were a person of color and the sun was going down, you had to be out of the city limits. No if, buts, and and. And, you know, some of these things, uh, you don't forget. It's just uh, something that was uh, instilled with you. And I, I read instances where especially mothers would talk to the young black men about do's and don'ts when they come to town or have dealings with people that was not your same color. And these things, you know, like I say, they stick with you for the rest of your life. And I remember this while I was in service, and I would remember this day to the day I died. We had inspection on a Saturday, and we had the first weekend at Fort Jackson, you can go to town, go anywhere you want to, as long as you be back by 6 o'clock Monday morning. And so me and this guy, we was going through basic training, and we decided to eat downtown and not eat in the mess hall. So we caught the post bus, and I didn't know where the color section of Columbia, South Carolina was, and he didn't know where the white section was. So when we got off the bus, we went into this little cafe. This is in 62. And we both in uniform. So the waitress, this was a white cafe. She came and took our order. And we ordered a hamburger, french fries, and a Coke. She came back a couple of minutes later, and she looked at me. She said, the color section is so many blocks up and across. And she looked at Will Cox. He was white. And she asked him that he want his order. And he told her, if Marcel can't eat here, I don't want to eat here either. And he could have said, yes, bring me my order. But he decided to make the stand, so we both got up. And Greyhound had integrated their lunch counter in Columbia, South Carolina. And some things you just don't forget. But when that happened to me, even though I was in uniform, I felt like, I was dirty. So, it, like I said, it was one of the best times. But one thing we had growing up in the 50s, you didn't have much money. And using the places that you, you lived, you rented, you had coal and kindling fire. You might have had beans five out of seven days, but you had plenty of love. I mean, that, you could never get enough love. You had it. I mean, and you, the people in the neighborhood was just like your seven parents. They could talk to you and tell you, don't do that. You may not like it, but you did what they told you. 
and you might have got around the corner and said, you know, Miss So-and-so had no business telling us that. And did not say anything to their face because you knew he was going to get back home. And God help you if he got back home. <laughs> And they didn't even at it. I'm glad I grew up at that time. I mean, no telling. And I see how the generation is today. Not all, but some. And it really hurts. It really does. Could you say your parents' names just so we have that documented? Uh, my mother's name was Ethel Bruton. She was a Williams Bruton. And of course, I was a Williams. And uh, I have an older brother and a younger sister. Of course, uh, when my sister came in the world, I was 12. So when I was graduating, she was starting the first grade. Now, she she grew up in the section of Shallow and graduated from uh, T.C. Robinson. And her class was the first class that uh, graduated, integrated class here in Asheville, out in the county. But I remember uh, working in St. Joe in 58. And we were janitors, but we wouldn't call them janitors. We was called hall boys. And why they named us that, I never know. And it was stenched on your shirt. They furnished shirts and pants. And it was stenched acro uh, stitched across the pocket the word hall boy. And being Catholic, I never could figure uh, lunchtime at St. Joe, you would go in the lunchroom and they had a curtain from the ceiling to the floor. And they would always draw the curtain at lunchtime. So white employees sat on one side and colored employees sat on the other side. And I always thought that being Catholic, and this was a Catholic hospital, but I guess they had to confirm to what the city told them. The city told them you have to have it this way if you want to have a hospital in this town. And uh, I saw something on them. Was it, do Asheville have a channel on cable? Mm -hmm. I was watching this, and this black lady was talking about the health care in Asheville for people of color. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe some of the things that she was saying. I grew up knowing that Jesse Ray Field Home used to be a colored hospital. Mm -hmm. And she was telling the history, how that came to be. And the doctor that bought the building couldn't sit on the front porch because it faces Bidmore Avenue. And I couldn't believe that. But, like I said, it was the best and the worst of times. We'll just go on down the line. Okay. We'll um, kind of circle back around. I'm Sharon Brown, never made it. I'm from Stumptown. And what I remember when I was growing up, uh, when I, it, it was segregated, they integrated on my last year in high school. I graduated from Stockbridge Falls, and I was in the 12th grade. They integrated the teachers first. We had white teachers at Stockbridge Falls. And uh, the next year, I went to Asheville High. But anyway, I remember going up. I can remember getting on the bus, sit, going to the back. That was all automatic. You know, you just go to the back. And then I remember downstairs in Woolworth, and New building had the white fountain and the color fountain. So one day, I was down to my mother, and she was doing something. I said, I wonder what the difference. I just got the white fountain. My mom said, You did what? <laughs> I said, I'm gonna see you in a different world. You know, she said, I said, I just want to see what the difference was. And then when they um, when they um. <laughs> They would sit, sit in front of the bus. From then on, I always sit in front of the bus. Even today, if I ride the bus, I'm not sitting on that bus. Sit, I'm not going to the back. And a few years ago, I used to drive a school bus. So I had to take my glasses in Madison County. Went to Madison County one day at a school. And the kids looked at me like I was from outer space, you know. 
So me and my girlfriend, who we went to have lunch, she was white, we went to have lunch. I said, I better get something that can't mess up. So I got me a, a grilled cheese and french fry. So she's sitting here, and I'm sitting here. So when the girl came back, she gave her a plate and put my plate way down here. Okay? This is like five years ago in Madison Council. And when I went back to head start, after class, I said, I can't go back out there because I don't feel safe. You got to get me another class somewhere else because I didn't feel safe back there. Because it was weird to look at me like, I'm out of my space. That's, that's, a, that's a bad feeling, you know, something like that. But anyway, I appreciate being more, uh, racist sometimes because, like you said, the elder people, whatever they say, you better do. <laughs> I mean, and we were poor, didn't even know we were poor. <laughs> really, you know. We always had food, we always had clothes, you know, but we were poor, but we didn't know it. I just appreciate the way I grew up, the neighborhood. Really, it was good. How was your date of birth? Oh, January 3rd, 1950. Woo-woo! <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be 70 years old in January. Oh, and I'm just proud. I'm still here. I hope I still be here for a few more years. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about the, the neighborhood you grew up in and the household? How many siblings you had? Oh, yeah, it was 11 of us. Wow. I can remember three or four girls in one bed. <laughs> you know what? Oh, and we had... Uh, we had chickens. We did. And uh, we had chickens for years, and then you know, the snow, the neighbor sort of complained about it, so we had to get rid of the chicken coop. <laughs> and she supposed to be a, uh, she a preacher's wife, or she supposed to be a Christian. But she complained about the chickens, so we had to get rid of them. And we used to play ball in the street, and the ball would go in her yard, and she'd pick them up and sweat and come over there. And know she had a ball, and she gave it to her nieces and nephews, and she played with it. We go to the house and we see our ball, man, you know. <laughs> and um, I worked at Woolworth when I graduated from high school for about a couple of weeks. Cause I, couldn't, I couldn't work up there. Cause, you know, I used to go to Woolworth and you know, call out what people wanted. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Hey, brother, hi, dog. I couldn't do that. I said, this is not working. I can't do that. I didn't have that kind of personality. But anyways, I um. I just, I just, I think the uh, neighborhood I grew up in because you come to my house and eat, I go to your house and eat. And this guy, his name was Big Jim. He always knew my mother cooked a biscuit. <laughs> he always stuck about me dinner with us that day. <laughs> but it was, it was always fun going to the neighborhood. Did you go to Hill Street School? I went to Hill Street eight years. Okay. Eight years in the morning. And then I went to see Stephen Street one year, and then next year went to Southwest Bar. Can you tell us maybe a little bit more about your school experiences, either at Hill Street or Stevens Lake or both? Well, going to Hill Street, walking from, we, we had to pass Randolph to go to Hill Street. And the Randolph's all white then, you yeah. know, so yeah. we had to go through Gulf Street to get to Hill Street. And then I was there for eight years, and then with Stevens Lee, used to walk from Gray Street all the way to Stevens Lee. Even in the winter, but it was cold sometimes. We did have, my dad did give us bus fare, but that was rare, I was poor. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, South East Floor, I walked to South East Floor. We had, we had the best teachers in the world. They really cared about us. We had good teachers. But I just appreciate the way I grew up, I do. You have a favorite or two teachers? Pardon? Did you have a favorite or two teacher? Well, my first grade teacher was Miss Cooper. She was good. And in, in uh, um, at a, I was born, Miss Pierce, Gladys Pierce. Mr. Cowan, he's kind of crazy. <laughs> but we had, we had, we had <laughs> And Miss Harris, remember Miss Harris? Oh, yeah. One day, yeah. one kid yeah. made yeah. her mad. We had her class before lunch. And one kid made her mad. She locked us in the classroom. <laughs> we didn't get no lunch that day. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get away with that now. No, <laughs> we couldn't get out. So we had still not in the room the whole lot of time and then we could get out, but I was so hungry. <laughs> but she was she was smart too, but she was kind of she's a good teacher though. So we had good teachers. Well she said all the things that I know. <laughs> <laughs> I also did.
lived in Stevens Lee in the schools, but I lived in Burton Street, and I live in the Burton Street area now, so we didn't have to walk to school. They, we rode a bus, and the bus had to come and get us and take us by 10 schools to get us over to the black school. <laughs> you know, we passed yeah. the neighborhoods and going that way, so, but we did, but thank God we didn't have to walk. But I was reared by this fine gentleman named John Conley, and that was yeah. my father, and he had no regard for separation of people things he felt like everybody was equal and equal and you could do what you said. So I was raised up to stand up for myself and you better not come home and say you didn't and to, and because you were just as good as anybody else and you better act like it all the time. So we were always there and my mom used to say to him, she's a girl. You're gonna get her put in jail because you know she acts just like you. Now you stop telling her, and I can just hear them with their conversations because she would go. They would go to the bedroom like it was soundproof. And, and she said, "You stop doing these things and telling her." And he said, "She's gonna stand up for herself just like me, and you better stand up for yourself too." And they would go back and forth, and uh, so she always kind of was concerned about when I left the house, uh, what was going. On if I was going to get arrested, <laughs> acting like my dad, I did that. And so one day she told me, you are from both of us. I'm your mother, he's your father. You have just as much of me in you as you have him. And I want you to start making more decisions about what I would do instead of what your father would do. <laughs> I said, but it's wrong. And you know, and I was really adamant about why can't you do it? Why do I have to go back to the back of the bus and stand up that's so crowded that you don't have to worry about falling because of so many people and you couldn't go up before the past the door. The whole front of the bus, you had to go to this back end to stay there. And so I just decided to day that I paid my money, and they didn't charge me less for standing. I paid the same amount that everybody else did, so when I got on the bus that day, I said, I'm not going to the back. I got right there. You got the bus, when you come in the door, there's a seat right at the door that separates the back from the front. So that's what I said. And somebody came and said, there's an in person sitting in the seat. And I said, where? <laughs> <laughs>
And so people started, even some of the, the white people on the bus started agreeing with me as well. <laughs> <laughs> So we got there, and my brother was in the back praying. <laughs> but anyway, I wound up in the seat um, all the way to West Asheville. And we got on in Preacher's Park and headed up to West Asheville, and I stayed in the seat. We got to Bridge Street up in Bell and got home. And I looked at the people that were so supporting me, and I said, thank you. And I got off the bus and went then, and I got in trouble when I got home. <laughs> How old were you? Uh, probably about 14, 15. Oh. But uh, it is at some point my daddy came home and I told him what happened. And he was all 100% because that's where I got that from. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mama said, don't you be talking to her like that because she can get herself ready in trouble or something. He said, well, she was right. <laughs> and he said, don't you tell her that she was wrong. You pay to sit on that bus. I sit where I please. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, and, and, and that's the attitude I mean, that we kept. I never tried to start anything, but uh, you know, I was don't tell you don't tell. If it's open to the public, then I am part of the public, and it, it is not right. And you shouldn't do this to people. So I marched in my marches and things in the community and across town. I'd go across, catch the bus, go across town, and get in a march in. That's what I'm sitting in. But uh, it was just. Uh, that's the way my dad was. He said, everybody is the same and you deserve to be treated the same. And I'm glad he taught me that in that, in that way because there were so many things that uh, went along that were not right. And uh, he just said, we're not going to stand for it. But uh, my mom had another thought. And, uh, but she was the same thing. You know, she said, don't, don't let anybody run over you. And we saw a lot of things growing up that were not right. Uh, and coming along and the way people treated you, I mean, you didn't have to ask if they were being racist, it was obvious. And uh, you go in places and you knew that they didn't want to wait on you, uh, but then they uh, would come along and they had to wait on you or something. But, and, and, and that's a terrible feeling for somebody to make you feel less than equal or less than human. And it was something that I was not going to show them or let them see in me. And to this day, I'm not going to let anybody try to put me down. I know who I am, where I came from, and where I'm going. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, and I've taught my children and my grandchildren, you don't start things, but you don't let people take away what's rightfully yours. Take away your pride and your dignity, because you're just people of people. And we have good people and bad people and have all races. But uh, you don't go around discriminating against people because of the color of their skin. And today I have some of my best friends of different races and different colors and my best friend over there. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, not an easy time to grow up and, and it took a lot for you to have self-confidence and feel comfortable. Uh, in your own skin because you would go so many places where you would the least person there and they're looking at you and you know they're trying to treat you differently than they do somebody else but uh, I was just totally convinced that if I'm here I'm going to act just like you and I'm going in and sit just like you. If there's a chair here I'm going to sit in it. And if it's not, and, and if it, you don't like that, then maybe you're gonna get up and move. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, and I just and I and I couldn't, and I don't understand today how an individual, being an individual, can look at other people and simply because of the color of your skin, all of a sudden there's a whole different way they approach you, or look at you, or try to treat you. Uh, that's uh, I said. How long do you stay up at night trying to figure out how to outdo a black person? <laughs> and why would you want to live that way? I mean, I don't want to go somewhere that, uh, you know, I got to think I'm better than somebody else or make that person feel uncomfortable. Why would you want to go through that yourself? Because people are people. I mean, there are some black people I don't like. But it's not because of the color of their skin, it's their personality. And uh, I think everybody should be, you should look at every individual 
And that's the way I was brought up taught to look at every individual for their own personal person. Everybody is different. Did and we tell have something differences. about how rich your history is of going to school in Berkeley Street. Uh -huh. Talk about how rich your history is around your education. <coughs> and we grew, I grew up in a community where there's uh, the man that started our community was a black man called E.W. Pearson. And he was just amazing. And he came here, we had, and, and that's why we had a lot more things going on in the Burton Street uh, area because of Mr. Pearson. And he was well known and accepted by a lot of uh, white people. And I, I wonder how sometimes when I thought about, think about how things was, it was even worse then, because this, this was years before I was born. Uh, it was even worse then, but he made, found his way, and, uh, and he started the West Asheville community, the Burton Street area. Uh, right now, I'm getting kind of upset because they uh, tried to take the name out of there. <laughs> but uh, and he was a, just a great man and uh, did a lot of things for the community, started a lot of things, businesses and things in the community. Uh, we had areas where he had built this place. He had a, it was a nightclub before I was born, and by the time I was born, uh, he had passed, and it turned, it made it into a community center for the community. And um, after, after some years of that, we came home one day, and here this man was with all this intelligence, and, and he was a Buffalo soldier for everything, very educated, highly educated man. And we came home one day, and he had a building there right on Burton Street, and they tore it down. Mm -hmm. Didn't say a word to anybody in the community. And this has been in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, they came into it. Now, we didn't even get a brick from it, a block from the building, uh, knowing, that, uh, knowing that man was all that he was because he was just, and you can go look him up, so I'm an E.W. Pearson, he was just a great man, way ahead of his time. And did your teachers talk about him, teachers they, at Burton Street? Yes, they did, and so, and I guess that's where I got some of my stuff from, <laughs> 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 knowing, knowing that uh, I, the person that started our community, what he actually went through, and how he uh, challenged them and built that community and, and it's still standing today, and people, and we are still recognizing uh, Mr. Pearson as our founder, and just finding, still finding even greater things that he's done uh, down through the years. He does have a few family members still living, but that really just tore us up when we came home and found out they had tore down that building. At one point in time, he originally it was a grocery store. And then later on in life, he uh, turned it into a facility where people would have parties and things and different things like that. So it uh, was there. But uh, I did come from a very great historical background community, and I want to live up to it and let people know that you don't, it's not the color of your skin, it's the content of your character. And, and that's what I tell my children, you know, it's your character, not the color of your skin. That doesn't make you anything but a human being. Then, then tell how many businesses were within your community. Oh, we had three grocery stores, and these were all, all by uh, black men. And we had several beauticians that had their own shops and things in uh, that was in our community. Wow. And uh, there are uh, five churches. Mm -hmm. And everybody went to church then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we had several churches. And we had one, and I didn't realize, and, I, and it bothered me in most of my life, uh, the one that Mr. Pearson actually belonged to is right next door to where I currently live. Uh, it was a United Methodist, which was uncommon in black communities. And, and every once in a while, growing up, I would say, get to be a United Methodist, and I had to get completely grown to find out uh, if Mr. Pearson uh, started that church. Uh -huh. And so, uh, and, and of course, he was involved with a lot of white people. Uh, he could have been as wealthy and, and as rich minded as he was, but he was the kind of person that could go and talk and do, and, and, uh, and people fell in line behind him uh, and did that. But, uh, that's how we wound up with the United Methodist Church. The other churches were Baptists, 
and we had one holiness church. So we had about five churches in that one little community. Wow. So the Lord was on our side. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother used to tell me quite often, we're acting like your daddy and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and then he say, Rosalie, you let that child alone. <laughs> the Lord's on my side. So I kept right on acting like my daddy. And when it was time to march somewhere, we marched and we went to there. And Mama would sit at home and pray and hope we got back. But uh, we did. But basically, we had the people that grew up in there, we had a different life um, because of Mr. Pearson, and it was a good life, and when doors were open up us to things that may not see in other black communities. And I'll quit because I can talk to him. And before <laughs> you finish up, would you say your first and last name, your birthday, and your parents' name, please? If you don't mind, okay. you don't have to. My name is Vivian Conley, C-O-N-L-E-Y, one N, one L. And <laughs> by what? Your parents' names uh, and your birthday. Parents, right? uh, John and Rosie Lee Conley. Uh, my dad was originally from Marion, and my mother was from Forest City, in mm -hmm. Dashville. Um, your birthday, if you want to. <laughs> well, that's fine. I was born July the 26th, 1945. And do you know when your parents moved to Asheville? Uh, they came when I was about three or four years old. My dad was from Forest City, I was Marion, and my mom was in Forest City, but they moved here way after they got married. Did they move for your parents' work, for your dad's work? Did they do what? Did they move for a specific reason? Uh, dad got a job in the area and uh, worked at, uh, for years as a place, and I think it may still be in business, they met your luck company, and uh, they did uh, vacuums and things, and he, uh, he was a professionally trained, but he could take them apart and put them back together. <laughs> Is that and so he got a job and uh, worked there for years until that place closed down. And so, uh, Is that the one I'm thinking of in West Asheville? Uh, no, it was downtown, like on Market, down Market, Lexington, something down that way. It was downtown Asheville. The company was downtown Asheville. And they were very good to him and us. And you should see our house at Christmas. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Margaret Full. I've been three block and visit. I'm from a family of seven. I'm the youngest. I grew up on Hill Street, and I grew up in a unique period. Segregation was beneficial to us in that we saw quite about our mentors right in our community. Uh, the uh, Teachers, uh, Ms. Howell was in our community. Um, the, uh, we had lawyers and teachers. The Deuce and Berries lived uh, uh, in that area. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, think of his name. Um, one, one of the uh, first doc one, one of the first doctors lived in our community. The Cash Johns were there in our community. So we were surrounded by a lot of people that encouraged us. Uh, and I went to uh, Hill Street School uh, for the first eight years, then I went to Stevensley. I graduated in 64. Uh, and um, I remember going to the YMI, it wasn't one of my couples, it was the YMI, and going down to the library. Uh, uh, my mom always used to tell me, look, people <coughs> don't look that, don't look that. And um, it, was, it was wonderful. I didn't realize until I was grown and it made my heart sad that I didn't get to give the teachers accolades. We at Stevens Lee had teachers who had PhDs mm -hmm. that taught us. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know Doc Leonard was, you heard Doc Leonard, but he had a PhD. I mean, most of them did. We were so fortunate to be educated by teachers that cared. Uh, and I'll just tell a short story. Uh, when we were growing up, you had to have, was it, I think it was 24 credits or 22 credits. Well, I was real, I was real uh, quiet, but really outspoken. I guess you would say aggressive, passive, aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I was a senior. And I, I said, oh, I had figured I got all my credits. We can do what we want to. So one day, uh, four of us who were seniors, we decided we were going to take a day off. <laughs> so we walked out of the school. I mean, out. Just got up, I mean, after the class, he didn't have changed his class. 
we walked out the front door. The only person who didn't walk out was her and Fred because she said her dad would just mask her. <laughs> but we, the rest of us, we decided we were big and bad enough to do that. And so we, we walked out of school. And back then, you didn't think of anything negative. All we did, we went to uh, uh, Alexis Gaines' house uh, off of South Side. And we just watched TV and ate. And when uh, we went back to school, Miss Rumley, I'm in the <laughs> You Yes, and my brother at the time was working as the janitor. And you have to know about a Stevens so you had all these doors, and it's a beautiful building. I just cringe when I think about how they took it down. But anyway, he had all these glass doors. And I told Mr. Romney, I will wash every window on every door, but please do not tell my mom that I walked. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and, and I, I just said, Some trouble, and she did. And I had to wash the windows, but I remember her telling me, "Well, if you don't have enough credits, I'm gonna make sure you don't graduate." In my mind, not out of my mouth, I said, "You don't know, I have 24 credits." <laughs> 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 but it was, it was, uh, it was the best of times. And after they said, I didn't really know how poor I was until I went to Chicago because I went to get a job. And everywhere I went, uh, the day would say, one man told me, say, well, you don't have experience. I said, well, how will I ever get experience if you do not hire me? And he looked at me, he said, you're a little too mouthy. You can't hire me. <laughs> I said, "Why?" Well, and then I was left-handed, so I never was able to get a job in the, uh, uh, on the line because they had no machines. So that pushed me into getting into administrative uh, uh, employment. But when I look back, what I treasure most is that we were taught uh, that, as Vivian said, you were good as anyone else. You had nothing to do, the way the system was set up had nothing to do with who you were. And I remember, uh, I guess I was always, didn't realize I was going to end up being a community person. But I remember begging my mom to let me go to the bean field with this lady, because I wanted to experience what it was meant to get on the truck and go pick beans. Okay, I didn't think of it as derogatory. I just wanted to experience, and I became a liability to her because you know you had to pick so many uh, during the day. So she was picking hers and mine. I never will forget. But and I remember riding on the truck, and I remember people laughing. But I didn't feel that. I thought I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to experience what people were doing. And I thought, well, that was probably forming me all along the uh, all along the way. And I had Miss Bertrand, Miss Cooper. I mean, uh, when you had, if you, and everybody, your report card, your report card was for your family, but your report card was for your community. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to see your, what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And we were laughing, I was like, uh, I don't know, uh, and I, I, I was like, gosh, you didn't realize how much they loved you, how much they encouraged you. Uh, and a lot of that, was, integration is good, but a lot of the peace in this, of community was certainly lost. But it can be regained by just like the young man sitting here with their coming with programs and embracing our young people. So our history is a way for you to know who you are. That's why it grieves me sometimes when people say, why you all want to talk about the past? Why you want to talk about Africa? Why you want to because you need to know your past. You need to know our forebears, they invented bomb and bombing. They meet, they did build, they built pyramids. They design things. So being an architect is not a strange word. If you feel in your heart you want to attain something, don't, oh, well, we're not, we, we didn't, our life didn't start when we were brought up. Our ancestors were already slaves. Our, our life and our existence and our contributions go way back. Mm -hmm. So that's what I had to tell my children. You know, you can achieve, uh, real, uh, you can edit this off, but I, I'll say, the people used to, who used to do the butter and eggs, play the butter and eggs, I have you remember that? Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how shocked they were. You know how they were setting that program up? Reading the cotton picking stock market. Because they printed the, the production of the eggs and the uh, but, uh, butter and eggs. And so that's how they read the stock market. And that's how they set that system up. It took me a long time to realize, oh, they were geniuses. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I said, to, for people to know how to preserve and, and uh, take care of their families uh, on a meager income, they were experts. Because I'm struggling, I think I'll do a pretty good little sale. But they just, they were the best cooks and very economical. And very lucky. 
Okay, I'm not an Ashevillian, but um, growing up at the same period in time, wherever you were, and I'm from, we're from Virginia, but uh, the comparativeness of uh, just how my friends and everybody grew up and the values that uh, you bought from home, from the heart, with you expands all over, uh, for all of us uh, who are sisters and brothers, but then who are identified as African Americans. Uh, we all had the same types of experiences, such as uh, uh, Marvin Cuthbert and Beautiful, Stevens Elite High School, uh, having to be knocked down. The same thing happened to our high schools. And I was in a conference in Raleigh a couple of weeks ago, and they had slide programs about all of the African American schools, the same thing happened to. So, so much stuff is just systematic and just um, hurtful, uh, vast plan of destruction for people. And it's very sad to see and to know that, but uh, it makes you even more interested in your history and more importantly in giving the knowledge and influence that you have to your children and to everybody else that you meet because it is just uh, so sad that uh, hatred is existing in all of the avenues that it has for so long and to see some recent ramping up of that and some things that were done in secrecy and but still in the same accord now being vocalized and publicized as a prideful thing seemingly from some people. So it keeps you praying, keeps you knowing that wherever you are you've got to be the best and most genuine you that you can be. And the sharing of it and meeting people in Marvin and uh, Vivian in my long time friends ever since I arrived in Asheville and to have your children grow up with their children, uh, knowing the value that's in all of them gives you that encouragement and that uh, pride uh, and endurance that you need. So. I'm, I'm Barbara, I'm real proud. This is my, two of my aunts here. Um, can you talk about, because you arrived, you're not a native of Asheville, neighbor place in Virginia, but um, you were talking about your children growing up with their children. Can you tell us uh, when you moved, relocated to Asheville? I came to Asheville in 78 with the job transfer from the National Park System. And uh, met Vivian first, and then uh, Marvin later, and Marvin's children and my children went to school together. Vivian had her kids in the city school. <laughs> children and mine went to school together and uh, yeah, I found just so much good sister brotherhood here and uh, the connection of people that God put in place we didn't do it ourselves uh, just is, is just astounding and so uh, when you can have friends and even if you don't see them for months or maybe a couple of years that same love is still there and uh, and, and when you can meet people and then bond with them as if you grew up with them uh, because of so much commonality, uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I'm just so proud and happy that the Lord had been spirit to say. And you owe back whoever you are so much for those types of places that you can't repay because it's God. Can you state your first and last name, please? I'm Barbara Bryan, and she just wants to know when my 
So I'll just go ahead and tell you. <laughs> My birthday is November the 4th, 1948. Now you got me. <laughs> thank you. I already knew that. I say happy belated birthday. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, Doc. My name is Deborah Reed, sister from Virginia. Um, we got here about 10 years ago. Um, one of the things I wanted to share, when I was from the fourth to the first grade, I was in, in second grade in school. And the, from the fir fourth, first to the fifth grade, I was in a second grade in school. In the sixth and seventh grade, I went to an integrated school. Eighth and ninth and tenth grade, I went back to a segregated school. Eleventh <laughs> and twelfth went to an integrated school. But the thing that always stands out in my mind is when I got to the sixth grade and it was integrated, the things that and my mother and father were uh, nurturers of being bold enough to be who you are, regardless of where you were. And when I got to the sixth grade, I had a, the thing that our parents did not realize, I don't think. When we went into an integrated school, we not only had, on the first days when we entered there, students standing there saying, we don't want you here. We had teachers standing there saying, we don't want you here. And we were in classrooms where we had to fend for ourselves in many instances. I had a, one of my teachers, Miss Deathenbar, I will never forget her name, she was the preacher's wife, and she was the most racist woman I've ever met in my life. And they would look at what your grades were up to that point, and that determined if they really were going to teach you. And I can remember her telling the African American boys they weren't going to make it. I can just distinctively, you know, so the nurturing that you all got from, uh, we all got from our black schools, they were mothers and fathers as well as teachers. Mm -hmm. And that was a community, so you had something to, I mean, it was all the way around. When you got to school, your mama was still there, and your daddy was still there. But when you get into the, when we got into the integrated schools, even down to the principals, I had one major incident where in the sixth grade I got put out of school. We had a Miss Deppenbar, I learned before, prior to that, did not have uh, uh, African American songs, song, well, I wish I was in the land, Dixie, and all those songs, she didn't sing them, but when we got to the class, she would have the black boys stand up in the back, white children would be on one side, so we would be carrying on the song, well, I never sung it, so one day she says to me, I'm noticing that you're not doing any singing, and I said, I don't want to go back to the land of cotton. Because old times for me have been forgotten. And she said, go to the principal's office. <laughs> so I went to the principal's office, and it was about a half a mile to go home, and he brought me out of school. And I get home that day, and I said, I know I'm going to get a beat. And my mother said, well, OK, we get, so they got to go and tell the people on that job, I can't come to work because I get her back in school on Monday. So we go. Father take us. He has to go to work. Lazy has to go to work. But they still haven't said anything, and I'm like, well, maybe I'll get a beating at school. And so we get there, and so she, my father said, you want me to go in? She said, no, I got this. And so <laughs> she goes, we go in. So they wait for an hour before we, we had an appointment, but an hour before she can get, so they're taking us into the office, and they're going to get a beating in the office. And she said, he said, no, I can't come. And I said, oh, no, she's coming. It's her story. She's coming. Go get the teacher. And she's coming. Oh, Lord. So he says, you know, with my infraction, I had to, my mom said, no, she's not singing the songs. Now, I don't know what you're going to do or how you're going to change them. She'll sing this one, that one, but she's not going to sing that song. She's not singing any slavery song, no, none of that. He said, ma'am, she says, she's not singing. So go get the teacher. Ms. Deathball says how I have just been disrespectful to her. I mean, you know, and she's telling all these stories, um, you know, and she can't tell. She says to her, he says, well, look. We'll, no, before then, he says, ma'am, because my mother was, my mother said, I will stand on your toes, talk to your nose so your ears can hear. Yeah. She would not be singing those songs. He said, do you, she said, and you don't want me to guard your car and get my husband. <laughs> you really don't want that. <laughs> and he, his face was blood red, hers was blood red. But she said, okay, she can come back. 
But I tell you what she will do, when we sing the song, she's going outside and standing outside in the hallway. I don't know what she had to, but she had to go outside. So the first day I stood up against the wall, she came right there. She said, you will stand up, you will stand up straight, you will not bend down, you will not touch the wall. And I played, she sang them songs for hours. Mm -hmm. But God is good. My seventh grade teacher, who was from Alaska, a 30-some-year-old man, Mr. Kontrovich. So he used to come down the hallway and talk to me. So she missed Jeff and when I took him to the office. And he said to them, you cannot stop. He said, what you're doing is wrong. But you cannot stop me from talking to her. So I will have my break when she has her break. And I'll come out here and I'll talk to him. What he talked to me about was he had, this, he had not experienced this type of racism in Alaska. So he didn't even know what was going on here. But they had a teacher's meeting on me. And so it was told that when they come out in the hallway, that Miss Delaware didn't see me in the hallway squatting or leaning up against the wall to make sure they put me back in the position that I needed to be in for the singing. So what she would do was, it would be funny, but I wasn't like arrogant or trying to disrespect her when I walked in the classroom. When it came time to sing, she would do this. You know, like, you know, she get on. <laughs> and I go, and then she, and so with that, but you went back to a strong family, a strong church, you went back to the nurturing, mm -hmm. and having had that nurturing before you left there, yes. you knew that regardless of what you do to me, you cannot stop me from being who I am or taking a stand. Because, and I didn't deal with it like my mother was saying, when you go back now, don't go back like you won a war. <laughs> 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 you know, go back now. <coughs> but that happened. So that's an instance where, where I had backup. But think of the children who didn't. Think of the ones who didn't get the education that they were supposed to have gotten. That, but that, that when you come into a classroom just by the color of your skin, you were neglected. Another one thing happened. I got some white friends, and they said, I said, it seems to me when we get to school in September. But some of y'all appear to be smarter than us. She said, oh, we take classes during the summer. They have grants and money for that. OK? I couldn't get to classes, but she showed me bring me the information. <laughs> and I studied it just like when I got Because I'm saying, how are they so much further here? Like when we get here, they already know. Because they are, they're going to some classes. And grants have been given to them. So no, no teachers are telling you that. You know. So I look at a given situation. And the, th the reason why I know God is in this, because we built this country. Native Americans preserved it for us, and we built it. Mm -hmm. And I don't care how you put that, but if you got 400, three or four years of free labor, if you can't become rich off of that, you never will. So when I come across people who say they did that, not me, I say, but you reap the benefits. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of the color of your skin, you reap the benefit. Mm -hmm. If you're not willing to deal with that fact, no matter where you go, you'll reap the benefits. Nobody asked you anything. They just look at you and say, OK, come on in. The house is over here for you. The job is back there. Oh, you don't have to know all those skills. Just come on in and we'll teach you. So the reason why I know that God's hand is on us, and the reason why I know that God sent us here, allowed us to come here to do all that we have done here, is because he's saying to us that without us, you can't make it. And without you, we can't make it. It's no way, because we are the root of this situation here. The blood wasn't shed for no reason at all. It was shed so that we could all come together, because God has no respect of person. Just like the flower garden, all these different colored flowers. When he made all his creation as an example to us, his creation does not discriminate. An animal may eat another because it's hungry, not because it's a lighter brown or it's white. It's survival. And when he made us, and he made us with a thinking brain to be here for, until we get it right, it'll never be right. Until we come together as a people and do what we're supposed to do with our humanity, we will, will never be until God says that all, it's like when he made the earth and says, it's good, until he can look at us as a people and say, it's good, it's good. you'll never get what you think you're trying to get here. Because it's, no, it's never going to be no powers, dominions, and, and principalities of one over the, uh, each other. 
we're going to have to do it together. The way he started it out to be is the way it's going to end up being. It may not be, uh, we may not see it, but there is generations that's going to come into this world, and they're going to see the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness. They're going to see that one day on this earth, in this heaven on earth. And I truly believe that. Thank you, Monty. I'm going to tell you one thing. <laughs> No I was blessed to be born on the March the 20th, the first day of spring in 1955. Thank you. You got a question? Yeah, go ahead. So, um, for those who don't know me, my name is Keenan Lake. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, the question, so I'm listening to you guys speak. Um, you know, I kind of got irritated because I went to the best high school in Asheville, North Carolina, which was Ash High, you know, I, know, I heard about Stevens Lee and all that stuff, but, you know, but Asheville High, you know, we, we I'm, you know, we, I know y'all we bears, but I was an eagle too at Central, so we fly high, oh, yeah, we're we're so but no, um, just joking, but no, I, I have so much respect for what you guys are talking about and for just your journey, and for the fact that you are, you all, for the most part, with the exception, who weren't here, but you all were lucky enough to attend Asheville High. We heard about the, the teachers and professors being um, not only doctors, but graduating from prestigious schools, Harvard and stuff like that. Like Stevens Lee, not yeah. Asheville High. Uh, listen, you were a native of Stevens Lee. You can't decide. <laughs> <laughs> you were a native of Stevens Lee. You were a native of Stevens Lee. That's who had the PhDs with Stevens Lee. It was not Asheville High. You're right. My question <laughs> is this. So hearing you guys talk about it, and it's not a comparison of you know which is worse, because I know living in you know, and you guys have probably half of, you know, I have half your time on this earth. Um, but I look at, as you guys talked about the things that you dealt with coming up, I look at how it is today. And so it's really no different. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys dealt with racism. I think, I think for me, and, I'm, and I guess I'm talking about it in my context, mm -hmm. it's actually worse today because it's covert. We don't see it. Mm -hmm. At least you guys knew where it was coming, like, okay, you're going to, you know, keep, be real. If you don't like me, you don't like me. I know how to deal with it. Now it's so covert and it's so, it's so underlining that you never know where it's coming from. You know, it could be coming from your supervisor, the person above them, and those are the people who smile in your face, hey, Rashida, nice to meet you, and be the same one with the knife in your back. And so I look at, when you guys talk about education, right now we have the fifth worst achievement gap in the nation at Asheville High, meaning that our kids... And it's not even close. It's something like Asheville Middle School eighth graders, 8% eight are on grade level. And these are black kids, 8%. That means 92% are not on grade level. Our, counterpart, our counterparts, I think it's like 87% are on grade level. So this is the disparity. This is the difference between our kids and, you know, so to speak, our, our Caucasian kids. And so again, I just want to know how you guys feel about that, like how, again, we are 50 years removed, I think you said you graduated in 57, so that's what, 50 years removed from that, and we're still here, and we're still facing and dealing with some of the same things in, in Asheville, North Carolina. Again, I too, I will say this, you know, um, growing up and, you know, with my pops and, and being on Eagle Market Street and the block and all that stuff, we came from a rich, rich history. Our people, we did a lot here. Now, it's almost like, you know, we, we have nothing left, nowhere to go, nothing, you know, and so how do y'all feel about that? I mean... No, it is different, and sometimes you can look back and see that uh, when we were coming along, I think it was because it was more open to us. We knew that there was racism going on. You saw it every day, and like you're saying now, it's undercover. Yeah. They have their ways of doing this and that to keep you separated and away from it, so it's not as open it's out there, but it's worse because you don't know who you can trust or you can't trust or what's going on, uh, uh, what you're getting into. But in those days, you you knew your enemy, right. and it's important. If you don't know who your enemy is, then you can't do anything about it. But in those days and times, you could, you knew that. And, and while we were saying we were going to Stevens Lee, and I think that we got the best education even better than what's going on now, because those teachers were concerned about you. Right. 
and they made sure that you learned what you needed to know, when you need to know, and your parents were right there behind you. You did not get a call from the teacher. No matter, it may have not been true, but the, the teacher said it, you were in trouble, there was no question about it, and they were supportive of you. So with the parents and the teachers working together, I said, we got a better education. Uh, we got a better look on life and, and, and things, but now children are just there and they don't care. I've seen some of them that's sitting there, and I said, don't you realize that you're not learning? You're just sitting there and you're not trying to do that, and they don't tell the parent of them. They just sit there and don't say anything, but in the meantime, they're just sitting there not learning anything. That wouldn't happen at Stevens Lee because if you didn't do your work or you didn't turn this in before you got home and they didn't have phones, that's what got me. <laughs> when you got home, they knew <laughs> what you were doing, and I bet you <coughs> try to. <coughs> try to do it again. You straighten yourself up because the teachers, the schools, the parents work together for the benefit of the child. I'm going to try to address that somewhat because that concerns me very much so. Um, it was such a break in families when, even though we lived in some standard housing, there was community. But when they moved, and I know, I know urban renewal meant for betterment, it just broke up so much of our cohesive support. And we know that, but I am really concerned that we who have, and I don't use this word like have, I don't know what, I won't use the word arrive. We no longer co-mingle with our, with our people. We don't co-mingle. We don't go, uh, I've done a lot of outreach through churches and uh, things, and they say, how can you go to Hillcrest? How can you go to Lee Walker Heights? How can you go to PVA? I said, because these are children's children, and if they are relatives that I, I know their parents, their parents know me. How can you say you cannot go? Some, somewhere we have become so accustomed to this public housing. My kids were raised out in public housing advocate. That does not say they're not teachable. That does not mean that they don't want to accomplish. But we have just, we have arrived in our little box and we are not looking out for our children. And, and so therefore, whatever Keenan is doing, it should be more support. But we just, we bought into this. Somebody's going, oh, you, you, aren't you scared to say something to the children? I say, these are children. <laughs> I knew there's a way to approach them now. Yeah. But these, these are children. And we're going to have to come back. It might not be all of us, but we're going to have to circle the wagons. And we're going to have to pull our children back together and pull our families back together. Not going and dictating and acting like you never said a cuss word in your life when you talk to parents and they're frustrated. And out of that comes some, some language. It's because they're frustrated. They go to school and, and, and they go to school and they, the, 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 their teen mothers, they're frustrated, and the schools all of a sudden put up a wall, call a resource office. I mean, and they're just, they're just, they're, they're distressed. And so somehow we, we who are, and I'm, I'm 37 reversed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> So somehow we're going to have to get in, uh, start circling the wagons of the young people who are doing something rather than being, how can that happen to that our children? Plus, you know, getting involved locally in your voting, knowing yeah. who your representatives are, yeah. making sure that you hold them accountable. There's a whole lot of stuff that's going on, and that some of the questions that I am, I would ask you to just get the ballot because they're saying I don't want you to vote for. I mean, you know, it's not that they're not interested, but we had a foundation of a church, and that's what kept uh, everybody going to church. So if everybody's at church, and, and you know, you may say, well, that was no good. They just gossip and they, but they, them being in your business made your business better. And you didn't understand that. You know, our foundation was sound, which was church. So from that, everything else came from that, from your home. I mean, you know, you're going to be at church on Sunday. I don't care what happened on Saturday. You know, and so we had a sound foundation. You know, our communication, as she says, 
we at, we have we have dealt with the stereotyping of our children from media and everywhere else, and we have programmed that stereotyping. So if they come up and say a curse word, oh no! But why don't you meet them where they are, not where you want them to be? And if you meet them where they are, you can get to that part. It's, that's just a layer that they have to just see if you're able to get through it. But there's so much underneath that layer that when you really get down to it, they tell you things and, and show you things and teach you things that's, that you're like, whoa. Because intelligence, I don't care what they're making in school, they have a level of intelligence that far exceeds anything yeah. we've ever even thought to have. Yeah. And creativity. So our blessings, how we act, while we first get to them is communications. You know, we have voting that's coming up. Let them understand how the system is working. Before you get to the presidents, you go into the local. All this is who the presidents are going to be. So if they're not doing anything for you here, then I can do anything for you there. Uh, you have people in your community who need to run for offices, who is just as bright as intelligent as everything else. So I'm thinking that you're going to have to start with talking to people. I mean, just actually talking to people to with a line of communication. That's where they are. And that's what you're saying. Like, go down meeting them where they are. And you can break down to the other levels. And we have to realize, and I'll say this, King, and I don't know how it can come about. But this has been a vision for me. I do not think our young people and the people in the public house know how much money they bring to the table back. I know, but they haven't known. Or they have kept it there. I'm all for the voting, but until you know the economic empowerment you have, mm -hmm. and they know you understand who, how you have it, and if you decide we are not going to take our food stamps or what they did back in the day when I had to have them, they were food stamps. We thought, hey, if you can't hire our children and they can't even move young a bag for us, or a baggers or whatever, then let's, we need to find out where we need to shop, because that money is transferable. And I just think that they don't know the value of what they bring to the city, whether it be public housing, whether it be food, and even the jobs, that even though the jobs are minimum wage, they don't realize how much money they bring in the you know, person out have nothing against them drinking a beer or uh, alcohol. But they, if they really understood, that's what Jesse Jackson showed in Chicago. He showed Budweiser how much revenue they was getting ready to lose because of how much money African Americans consume in their, their beer business. So I don't know how you bring a king, but somewhere people have got to start seeing their value. Let me, let me say this to the piggy I know you had a question, so you're going to say yeah, something too. Mr. But let me just say this to piggyback up what you said. I think you are 100% right. And I've been telling, me and Rashida have been having this conversation for a very long time. I think part of the problem here in Asheville, though, is that we don't make up a large population of people. So we only make up 5.7% of the population. 3.2 live on or below the poverty line. So that's almost one out of every two of us living in poverty. They know this. So like if it's in Atlanta or Charlotte, you know, places where we have a much more flourishing uh, African-American population, they can do exactly what you said. They can demand, we as people can demand that you have to do what we, you know, we, we're not going to spend a dime in your store until you, until you rectify the situation or you invest more on us. Here, we know we got 5.7 or 3.2, we don't bring revenue to the table, so they don't, they don't have to really respond to us at all. They don't have to tell us stuff. They don't have to notify us about stuff. They know we're not coming to the restaurants downtown or we're not shopping in their stores. So it's like, why should we value Miss Sharon or Rashida when they're not spending no money? Now, we might not want them here because of the color of their skin, but we know if they're spending that green, we got to respect them. If we ain't respecting them because they're not spending no money, then they can go ahead on and get lost. And that's the mindset. So it's like, how do we... You know, I think we have to really, I think is that, I think everybody says some great things, especially about us coming together. If we don't come together, we in a lot of trouble. If we don't, we don't figure that piece out. But I'm trying to navigate how we make the powers to be, be that be the county, the city, you know, those folks who have the, or who are the decision makers. Well, Ashford does not have a large population of people as far as African Americans. We don't. But 
we have people here who need services, who need support, yeah. who need resources. So well, even though we're not spending the funding and the money in your place, you still need to respect us on how we're going to do that. Well, she said voting is a piece of it on local yeah. level. But I'm also thinking, you may not have an appeal here, but how many black churches do you have here? A well, we have a lot. Okay. But the, well, I will say this too. We have a lot of black churches, but it's almost the mindset we have we have too many chiefs and not enough Indians. So with our churches, we, we have most of our churches, and I'm a, and I'm a beacon, if I'm, y'all please correct me, but most of our churches have a, a congregation of about 19, 20 people. Mm -hmm. And that's spread throughout the, the 50 churches that we may have. Mm -hmm. So they're spending their widows just to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. and, and, to keep, you know, and so when I was coming up, and I think, you know, churches was was outreach. Like, we're we going to get out in the community. And you like you said, you know, I was in that era. My dad, you're going to church. You're going to get up and you're going to go to church. You know, that's what's going to happen. But even if it wasn't my dad, you know, the deacons, hey, boy, we ain't seen you in church. We, we know where you're at. Now you don't have that. And, again, I think, I think from this is my opinion, I think, again, we have too many pastors who are not willing to, to, to either come together and say, okay, we got all these churches, but we need to get bigger congregations. So let's combine, mm -hmm. you know, just like you look at Biltmore Church, Biltmore Baptist, and all these churches. You know, Biltmore Church has four churches, but they got thousands of people going to that one church. Mm -hmm. So how can we how can we come together and say, okay, we might need to downsize and not have so many churches mm -hmm. and have more of a population because we can't have all these churches with just enough members to keep the lights on. Right. You know, I mean, it's to, and then when you start talking about the real work. We can't do the real work because pastor tied, deacon tied, and, and we got, you know, and then nobody's getting out. Everything's happening within these four walls. So what was your experience historically in the churches? What did it look like? Who would like to talk about in, in Buncombe County? It's not like it used to be. Mm -hmm. It's not so what's your experience? The church was full, mm -hmm. and now you're going to get uh, 10 people coming on mm -hmm. Sunday morning. You may have 10 this Sunday, 15 the yeah. next, yeah. 3 the next, and... Uh, it's just something, uh, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because then I had thought about the seriousness of the lack of the memberships in the churches now. I said, in the past, you had no choice. Right. When Sunday morning came, you went to church. Yeah, cool. And now, when Sunday morning, morning comes, you sleep an extra an hour or two, and you don't even think about it. And uh, how many parents actually come to church, but they don't bring the children with them? Or and people, that would never happen. They're doing home. They're, they're watching. They're watching. They're, they're, they're streaming it online. They stream it. They stream. They're watching the church online, or they're watching it on TV. And so it's like I ain't. You know, I could just watch this online. So I don't have to physically be there. And I think we 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 are not ministering to the children. Uh, first, uh, the Baptist church. Uh, is it First Baptist? The one you just talked about. Bill Moore Bill Baptist. Baptist. You know how they built that congregation. They serve the children, and the mm -hmm. children brought in the parents. Mm -hmm. Right, the parents brought in the children. Uh, right, right. So they serviced, but rather than pointing finger, they went out and they started serving and meeting the needs of just what Kenan said. And we know education is a, uh, there's a gap. When we were going to church, I mean, you had, we, we you know, you don't have to have all this expertise. We can help kids from kindergarten I always maybe I might can help my granddaughter to fourth grade with the math, mm -hmm. but the reading. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to come together and take our assets and mm -hmm. go in and help our children. Mm -hmm. yeah, but true. not go in and dictate. Kenan has a whole different way of doing things because right. he's a different generation. But if he says, Miss Martin, can you come and read? Mm -hmm. Can you come? Uh, can you be committed to read? Then that you know. One, because I always have said, any child given the proper tools and proper training can learn. Mm -hmm. But they've got to know we care rather than pointing fingers at them. Right. And children know when you are afraid of them when you won't bother with them. So my thing is, if whoever's going to help Kenan, if you don't really can't deal with the children and the parents and their atmosphere, mm -hmm. don't volunteer. Because you become, you become a debt rather than a, li uh, uh, a liability, a liability mm -hmm. rather than an asset. A asset to them. Mm -hmm. So we can talk, but there's a lot of things we can do right now. Before we get to the, we got to vote. I don't think we got to vote, we got to work. Yeah. And communicate, <laughs> whatever your job is or whatever people you go past. Start a line of communication with people. That can be in the mm -hmm. market a lot. 
you would be surprised. I was in Walmart one day, and these two young guys walked in, and I said, I'm going to deliberately say, I said, can you all help me put my stuff in the car? And they was like, yes, ma'am. And then we started talking, and I was asking them about certain things, and one of them was an artist. He drew, he went up to his car, got his painting, showed me. Another one, he said he was, he had dropped out of school, he'd gone to jail, dropped out of school, but got back in, and he was doing something, getting ready to do something. But what I'm saying, if I stereotyped them and said, oh, I can't communicate with them, oh, just let's go. And so you're surprised that the people on your job or wherever you are, start a line of communication about something other than foolishness and do some serious talking to people. People are listening. I, I think they're yearning. They, are, they want to be fed, but nobody's doing the feeding. And it could be just in showing kindness. I know I work part time for B and B pharmacy. And just like you were saying, I come across a lot of young black men. And if I happen to be out shopping and I see a young black man, probably in his little twenties and he has a kid with him, boy and little girl. I don't know you, and I'll walk up to him and I'll ask the question, is that your child, or your daughter, your son? And they would say, <coughs> and then I would comment, you know, it makes me feel good to see a young black man out somewhere with his child. And they would, sometimes they would come back, yeah, I'm, so, yeah, I'm proud of my, son or daughter or whatever. And I say, a lot of times, we'll get the children and we have done our job. It's a lifetime job. And getting back to education, <clears throat> when I take medicine to someone home, if I see some kids there of the school age, I always ask them, how you doing in school? What are your grades? And they would tell me, well, I can get C's and maybe a C minus. I said, well, can we do better? I said, we have a mind. And I'll tell you the answer that I tell people this. I used to carry Hill Street mail, because I went to Hill Street when I was coming up. But anyway, I carried their mail, the school. And I used to eat in the cafeteria. And one day, I'm in line, and this little black kid, he's next to me, and this little white girl was next to him, and they knew each other. And she asked a math question, and he came up with the wrong answer. And she was making fun of him, and he made the comment, I don't need to know math, I'm gonna be a rap singer. And I asked him, I said, you gonna be a rap singer? He said, yes. He said, I said, you're going to make plenty of money, right? And he said, yeah. I said, well, who's going to count your money? <laughs> and I always try to emphasize education. And we have talking about getting out the vote. Now, when I couldn't carry, when I was carrying the mail, I couldn't politic. That was a no-no. And in 92, I retired in October and November was election. That's when Bill Clinton got elected. And I carried housing. Just about every project in Asheville, I carried their mail. And I went around that month before election and I knocked on doors <laughs> and I preached and I got a lot of negative response. And that really upset me because I know People of color and white have died giving people the right to vote. And when I knocked on doors and young people came, why should I vote? I don't need to vote. Ain't nothing gonna change. I say, I know one thing, if you don't vote, nothing will change. <laughs> and I still do that today. I walk up to strangers, ask them they registered. Why not? Well, someone said, I said, that's no excuse. And you know, I guess being the age I am, I feel like I can pass what wisdom I have unto the younger generation. And this is where the key is going to come from, the younger generation. 
because people my age and a little younger, we done had our time. So we got to pass on to the young people. Because if we don't, we are lost. We are lost. And that's why I'm surprised that we didn't have as many young people here. I mean, the young people could have learned from the wisdom that we had here. And I'm I'm disappointed. Maybe the next time, the 23rd, yeah, maybe the 23rd. I'm going to talk it up yeah. from, from the day to the 23rd. Yeah. Maybe next time we will have a good gods of people, young people. Right, you folks can all come back. <laughs> we got to continue to have these. Yeah. We do. This is, this is the very first yes. one. Okay. And I think just the, the staff members didn't quite know how to arrange it. Yeah. And, and, and you folks probably didn't know what to expect. But if you will get out and say good things, and we have the recording, you know, <coughs> all the wonderful words that you folks have spoken today mm -hmm. are right there. And, and we, can, we have the ability, of course, to put that up online now. And so we'll definitely get that done uh, probably by Monday or Tuesday. So there are many ways that this good work can, can get out. And if you folks want to come back now for this next one in what, a couple of weeks, I think, mm -hmm. please do. Don't feel that you've put in your time and now it's time for someone else. I'd like to ask a quick question of the group as we're sort of wrapping up. But what I'll do first is, starting with Aunt Deborah, is uh, if you take one and just pass it around, then you have at least one invite that you can give or use as a reference when you're helping to spread the word Wonderful. to people in your community. Um, there are, we, I think that just what I know of the work that you all have done over the years in this town, I'm so proud. I tell my Aunt Barbara all the time, I'm like, I know all the stuff she was involved in. I know it personally just how much frontline work she was doing over the years in Asheville. But as pertains to community work, right now, myself and my colleagues, Keenan and Rashida and others of our generation, um, 30s, 40s generation, we you know, really, really want to make sure that we're doing our best work. And so what I want to ask you is, if you can name just one thing that you know was really effective for you all when you were doing this work that we could just take with us to help inform how we walk in this work in Asheville, I would personally appreciate it. Even if it's just naming one thing. Maybe we go around and just name one thing that we, we can carry with us to do this work most effectively, the way you all have done it. So I say stay committed. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Stay committed and don't, over, don't overwork. Yes, ma'am. You can become overworked being committed. Yes, indeed. Just keep okay. doing what you're doing. I'm certain that. Share what you have. I work with the National Park Service, and one of the community work that Lucia is talking about is every youth that I could get hired with the National Park yes. Service Youth Program, they got a job. And so if you get into somewhere where you can. Um, help people like that, do it boldly. Mm -hmm. uh, they got tired of me doing that, but I did it. And, uh, I still know of African-American young ladies and young men that say, oh, your aunt, oh, she gave me a chance once. <laughs> <song. laughs> if anybody ever and gave me a chance. And then you look chance. up and you see your people like Libby Cowles, who's now the director uh -huh. of YWCA. She worked in my office for all of, from high school through college, mm -hmm. and just so proud of her and many others. Yeah. So just share what you, when you, if you get your foot halfway in the door, then you prop it there and <laughs> let somebody else get through it. Yeah. And uh, so that's a good way. I know. Um, last week, I went in the DMV. I've been driving on some years. I went to the DMV a couple weeks ago. And I saw two black women in there. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I have never seen anybody black in the DMV office. <laughs> two beautiful young ladies in there. Nice. And I said, I'm so glad to see you. Yeah. I mean, it made me feel good. Because all the years, they never had a black person in the DMV. They got two now. Yeah. Because I know, speaking of what you said, I know when I was carrying mail, we had over 100 city carriers here in Asheville. And only 10 was black. It's like we got a ceiling, we're not going to hire but so many. 
And I know for a fact, when I was carrying, I tried to get our first black female. We have a couple now, but I taught pure the H-E-L-L, -L, bringing this point up. And we had an EEO committee, workers and supervisors, and we would meet every quarter. And as soon as we meet, I would bring up the same subject, why we do not have any black females carrying mail. The white carriers used to ask me, Marcel, why we don't have no black females carrying the mail? I said, because the system here don't, don't want any. And we had one lady, she took the post exam, she made 98 out of 100. Never got called for an interview. Wow. And the sad thing is that Class Thomas was EEOC, we were ready. So I told this young lady, I said, are you good and write letters? I said, write a letter to the Postmaster General of D.C., Class Thomas in D.C. And we was on the members, sent a letter to the members. Uh, do you know, you all know Billy Bam? Mm -hmm. Billy was carrying mail. And they sent someone up for green, a black gentleman. And we met down to the Hillcrest, that's where the young lady was living. Billy came. And we told the story. We showed her score. Not even called for interview. 98 out of 100. No veterans point. And so some of us, we get to the point that I got my cushy, cushy job. I'm not going to make waves. I wear a suit and tie. So when we was at the young lady's apartment, the Hilbert's telling the situation, he was a black guy. He had like he was interested. And I made a comment. And I said, well, I guess the reason why he's not really interested is the same person that signed your check signs mine. And he got upset. What do you mean? I said, you know exactly what I mean. And a couple of days later, Billy Bam was on work with Carl, like duty, got hurt on the job. Two days later, he get a letter from the post office here in Asheville saying they didn't have any more like duty. He was being transferred to Hendersonville to work at that post office. And if he didn't know, they was going to terminate him. And he went to Hendersonville and got friends with one of the white clerks. And they, he told them that Asheville had called Hendersonville and told them to be on the lookout for Billy Robson, that he was a Martin Luther King, and he was a troublemaker. I mean, you know, Asheville, I guess, I don't know. I've heard people say they moved here from other towns and said that they had never seen a place like Asheville, North Carolina. And I keep thinking, well, one of these days I'm going to wake up and Asheville is going to be unique and for the things that you hear from other places. Yes. I know the first time I went to New Orleans, this was in the 80s, and it was a quick time downtown. And I got a shock of my life in downtown New Orleans. I've seen so many black <laughs> guys and gals coming out of offices with suits and ties. I could not believe this. And I said, in Asheville, you might see a black person here with a suit and tie or a female in a business suit come out of office. But down there, they were just pouring out. And it just shocked me to them. <laughs> that, that was, you know, when you're not used to seeing yeah, something, you, know, you, know, see, you <coughs> have to say, whoa, what's going on? I'm going to say something else real quickly. Another thing that we need to do more of, and Vivian is just excellent at this, she used to have dinners and stuff in her heart. Everybody had to work glass, eat the glass, to set the table right and do it. What She'd have the whole church, everybody that came that day or in the community, wherever. Well, we had the dishwasher going and washing dishes up <laughs> in the night. But 
to show people how to properly sit at a table, sit down there and eat, and, you know, and she just got to do everything just right and what. But I saw so many people through that transition uh, sit down like little queens and, and appreciate. So those appreciative things that you know and that you can share give self-esteem also to people. And uh, that's something that, and then, you know, she was a belt fashion woman. And so <laughs> the, the people had to dress. I mean, she'd tell you to get this and straighten this up, do that, and you know, we'll put this with that. But all of that is enhances people's lives in ways that you don't realize. So just passing on the values of, that you have and the things that you know uh, to, to people that haven't been exposed to them is a good and thing. Don't let it fall on you short. The, the seeds that have been sown through the generations will is, will come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Don't that's why hope and faith and love. Don't deal with it like okay that was then and here we're here now. No, you're the product of those seeds. And mm -hmm. you have what that seed had in it. Just like all of the, us got what we got, you have it too. So that seed is still there. Can't can nobody take that root of that tree away. And I, I'm hoping these young people that are actively working in what you all are doing share what we can do to help directly. Don't let this just happen and it fade away and we come back next year and say it again. <laughs> because everybody can do something. Right. And so let us know. They're giving us a signal. Okay. Okay. And we'll it up, I, want, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart and tell you how much I appreciate and how much I've learned. I like what you said about the seed. My, my dad used to say to me, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he would not depart from it. And, that, and then my dad would step back and add his own words. <laughs> he would say, and you know, I'm, I'm not completely happy with you right now. <laughs> I'm convinced as you get older, right? and I think that's absolutely true. I'm a lot more like my dad, who is a very Christian man now, than I was when I was 15, 20, 25. He was still talking, talking to me when I was 30. So, thank you all again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Here's for all of y'all.